Now are we recording? Yes. Okay. Um, I was actually about to point out that the video of this will be on YouTube, so if there's anything that you missed and want to go over again, uh, in a couple days it'll be up. We'll send that link. So, we are going to be using a software called Autodesk Inventor. It's made by a company called Autodesk. Go figure. Um, Autodesk is best known for AutoCAD, which was the beginning and end alpha and omega of like CAD software for about 20 years. And then somebody was like, wait, we can add another dimension. We can have three of them. And SolidWorks showed up, and Pro-E showed up, and Katia showed up, and Autodesk was like, wait, us too, and they made it better. Um, so if you've used SolidWorks, heard of SolidWorks, it is very much like SolidWorks, but it's from a different company. Um, they've been converging over the past few years to the point that they're almost identical. Uh, and if you can use one, you can probably figure out the other. Um, so let's talk about what you can do with this kind of software. You can model parts. Uh, this is a part of a UAV that I'm designing for the landing gear. Um, and then once you've got parts, you can put them together into assemblies. Once you've got all your parts designed, if you want someone to make them for you, you're going to have to somehow communicate what you want to make. So you can make drawings. Um, you can also do a lot of other things. You can render images. Uh, this, I did this in about 30 seconds, uh, so it looks terrible. But if you play with the lighting and the backgrounds, you can actually make some pretty professional looking renderings. You can render animations, which is something that I've never done, but it can be done. And there's also some kind of presentation feature that I've never played with, but it's there if you're interested in it. Um, so I sort of, I touched on this, why you should use it. The big one is it's free. Um, whereas SolidWorks is gonna cost, I don't know how much if you get it legitimately and you know, possibly get arrested by the software police if you get it illegitimately. Um, Autodesk knows what's good for them, and so they give away free copies to anyone with a .edu email address. Because, you know, if you've got all these engineering students, and you say, here, use my software for free, and then they go and get jobs, or at companies with deep pockets, they will want to use that software. Um, and it is just as good as SolidWorks, I promise. Um, there are some differences between them, but most of them are cosmetic. Um, and there's a little bit of a learning curve going from one to the other. I started with Inventor, I've since learned SolidWorks. I think it's easier to go from Inventor to SolidWorks than SolidWorks to Inventor, but that's just me. Um, so the big thing is if you're designing something that you want to actually get made, you can export files from Inventor or from SolidWorks for that matter um, to assorted computer-aided manufacturing software to load it into CNC machines. Uh, the shop bot down in the think box, which is not yet available for general use, but in the next semester or so will be. Uh, and it's basically a giant CNC router for cutting things out of wood or plastic. Or the think box laser engraver, which is, it's a laser. It cuts things, it's awesome. Um, so you can design things in software and then have machines make them for you without you ever having to know anything about how they're made, which is kind of nice. Uh, the real thing that's nice about designing in software as opposed to designing on paper is it makes it really easy to play with dimensions and design geometry. Whereas if you're drawing something out on paper um, and you've got you know, an angle you want to play with, you want to move the position of some mounting holes, you have to you know, erase everything, redraw everything. Whereas in software, you can change one dimension and see how it affects all the rest of the geometry of your part. And I'm going to show that once I start getting to demoing some of this stuff. But it's a really good way to play with designs because you don't have to you don't have to imagine things yourself because you've got something that's doing that for you. So if you're not the kind of person who's very visual, you've got a computer that can do the rendering for you and see how changing one parameter can affect your whole design. Um, like I said, you don't have to draw things by hand. If you're the kind of person who cannot draw a straight line or a round circle, this is for you. And I'm one of those people. Um, I am really, really terrible at doing manual drafting, and that's why I love working with software. Um, so that's the end of my little slideshow. I'm gonna go straight into the software here. So when you first open up Inventor, um, and like I said, you can get it for free online, and that address is students.autodesk.com. And for people watching the video, there's probably going to be a link in the comments. But, so when you first open up Inventor, this is what you're gonna see, um, and you're gonna wanna make a new part. Click on new. And let's see if I can make this hide. I'm trying to maximize stream real estate here, but anyway. 
So you make a new part. Uh, we've got a few options here. One is a sheet metal part, which is something I'm not going to get into today, but if you were designing something to be made out of sheet metal, where it's going to be bent into the shape you want, there's a lot of tools in the sheet metal parts for doing that. Um, we've got a DWG, which is a 2D drawing file, um, a inventor drawing file. These are the presentation files I talked about earlier. And you've got parts, which are blocks, and assemblies, which are stacks of blocks. So we're going to start with part. Um, and it's going to take a sweet time loading. Um, and once the part opens up, the first thing you're going to see is a sketch. Every part starts with a sketch, and there's going to be usually multiple sketches that make up a part. And this is taking longer than I thought, but come on. Um, it does take kind of a beefy computer to run this software, um, but for, my, for reference, my laptop here is about four years old. Um, so if you've got a more modern laptop than that, you'll probably be all right. And if you've got a desktop from any time in the last you know, three years, you'll definitely be all right. Okay, here we go. So, we've got, this is our part, and you see we've got all these tools now. Um, and we have one sketch. Over here in your model view here, these are all the things that make up your part. And you can see we've got the sketch open. And when you're in a sketch, you've got this sort of grid paper view. Um, and I'm gonna, before I do anything else, I'm gonna talk about navigating a little bit. Um, so if you want to pan around, if you have a mouse with a scroll wheel, and you click your scroll wheel, that will drag for panning. Uh, if you use your scroll wheel, you can zoom in and out. And you also have this little box up here for rotating things. So if you want to look at things in 3D, and we'll just click on the face and you can zoom. So here we've got our blank sketch. And let's say we wanted to make a part um, let's say we're going to make an enclosure. We've got some kind of electronic device we want to put in the box. So the first thing we're going to do is we're going to start by making our face plate. And I picked the rectangle tool up here and just made a rectangle. Um, and the next thing I want to do, so the nice thing about uh, CAD software like this as opposed to the old style CAD software, if anyone's used AutoCAD, in AutoCAD, you had one chance to get your dimensions right. You drew it, and once it was there, it was a real pain to change your dimensions. In software like this, you can just kind of haphazardly stick whatever geometry you want in there, which is really good for playing around with stuff because you can resize everything really easily. And most importantly, you can permanently define your dimensions with the dimension tool. So generally, your, your workflow here is you're gonna slap down basic geometry. So let's say I've got a box with a couple of circles in it. Um, and they're all arbitrary sizes. Then I can go in and I can define my dimensions with the dimension tool. Um, by the way, if I'm ever flying through something, um, there's a tendency once you've been using software like this for a while to just start like blazing through things. So if at any point I do something and you didn't see it, just stop me, please. Because if you don't see what I'm doing, then I'm not explaining anything. So, all right, so now we can add dimensions to this. And dimensions are one of the ways to constrain shapes. So let's say we want to make this 10 inches by, uh, let's make this one 8 inches. Uh, and you can see that the lines change colors. Uh, so we've got these circles here are still green. So if I grab them, I can drag them around, I can resize them. Purple lines, they don't move. Uh, that means they're fully constrained if you taken any kind of statics courses, you have a deeper appreciation for what that means, but in the context of this, it just means that they are fixed in place. Um, and so basically you want all your sketches to be fully constrained, because if they're not, then it's really easy for you to go in later and accidentally mess something up. So let's finish constraining this sketch. So let's say we want to have two of these circles the same size. We could dimension both of them or we could use some of our other constraints. Uh, we have, looks like 12 constraints up here in addition to the dimension. And one of them is this equals sign. And actually, if you hover over any tools, it will give you these really helpful tool tips. So what the equals sign does is it constrains things to the same size. So if I take, say, these two circles, make them equal, now they're equal. So if I resize one, I resize both. Uh, and I'll just 
just stick a dimension on one of those. Say so that's a one inch diameter circle. Uh, by the way, if you're ever in a tool and you want to just go back to regularly right selecting things, you hit escape. Or if you right click on the screen, you get all these little menu items. Um, so, now I've got these two are the same size, but they're still not fixed in place. And there's a few ways that we can fix them in place. We can either use dimensions to put them in position. So let's say I want this one to be maybe two inches from the edge. Now that's dimension in place. But there's also a whole bunch of other constraints that I can use. So let's say, for instance, this is the tangent constraint. So I can put this one right on the edge. And now it's fully really constrained. It's two inches from the edge, and it's touching this edge. Um, and let's stick this one. If I put this one, this is a horizontal constraint, go between there and there. Now those two are, the center points are horizontal. And you can see a dimension on here, like three inches. And let's see, let's center this circle so I can make a vertical constraint. I'm just kind of making this part up as I go along. Obviously, if you're actually designing something, you'd be picking these constraints based on some kind of design that you have. And so now I'm fully constrained. So now that I've got this 2D sketch, I want to turn it into something three dimensional. So if I go over to the model menu here, I've got a few tools for making three dimensional shapes out of two dimensional sketches. And what we're going to use here is extrude. So extrude is exactly what it sounds like. Um, you grab a profile, which is any of these closed shapes, and you click on it, and it will extrude it. And you can choose how far you want to extrude it, the direction you want to extrude it. So let's say we want this to be a quarter of an inch. So now I've got this quarter of an inch plate. Um, one thing that you can do, if you go over to the model view here, um, if you want to make it easier to remember what's what, you can name your features. So this is our big poles. Um, so let's talk about making more features. So we've got this one plate, but let's say we want to do something more complicated. Before I talked about making an enclosure for something. The enclosure is a box. So if we want a box, we're going to need another feature. So I just made another sketch on the surface of that plate that I already made. And if I make another rectangle here, and I just sort of arbitrarily stuck that in there, um, but I can constrain it in place. So let's say I want to constrain it to be centered on there. Now, because I, I did horizontal and vertical constraints on those center points, as I marks the sides, it'll stay the same size. So I'm just going to drop in a couple of dimensions. So now, what do we do? Okay. So now, if we extrude this, I'm selecting this outer rim here. Turn this into a box. Right now it's not extruding very far. Uh, so let's say we did that like four inches. Uh, except you can see if you look at it, uh, it's extruding the wrong way. Oh, one thing I didn't mention before that I meant to. Uh, in addition to being able to use either the mouse scroll wheel and this box up here to rotate, uh, if you use the F2, F3, and F4 keys, F2 gives you the pad and then you can just drag it. F3 gives you zoom and F4 lets you rotate. This is really handy or just kind of moving, moving things as you're doing other stuff. I tend to keep my hands on F2, F3, and F4 while I'm, while I'm modeling things. Um, so you can see this is extruding the wrong way. Um, so we've got this loop here. So if we change the direction of that extrusion by clicking on this little direction arrow, now it's going the other way. So now we've got this box with holes in it. That's awesome. So, name my feature here just so I don't forget about it. Walls. Um, so, what if 
we wanted to put some mounting holes in it. There's a few ways we could do this. Um, and you can see up here we've got a hole tool. So if I click the hole tool, what comes up is the option to put a hole in any sort of surface, any part. Um, so if I click on this space, and then it's going to ask for references. So just make dimensions from the sides. So now I've got a hole that is an inch from the side and an inch from the top. And if you zoom in, you can see there's a hole there that it's making. Um, and there's some things you can do with this hole. Uh, so you can just uh, make a, a hole with a diameter that you specify. But what's really powerful about the hole tool that makes it better than, say, just extruding circles into things is you can have it pick the size for you for a screw. So say you know that you want to screw something to this that uses an 832 machine screw. If you click on this little clearance hole, which you can see is a, sort of a screw in a hole, and then pick the size, now we've got a clearance hole for a number eight screw. Or you can make it a tap hole. So now we've got a threaded hole for an 832 screw. And then when you generate drawings from this later, it'll say that that's threaded, you hand it to a machinist, and he knows what that means. Um, so, and another thing here is uh, this, this depth is how deep it's threaded. Um, and termination. Termination is how deep your hole goes. In this case, it's going through all. So it goes through this plate, and it just keeps on going. So usually you don't want that. Usually you're either going to want to set a depth, in which case this pops up, or you're going to want to have it go to a feature. And that's what I'm going to do here. So I clicked two, and then I'm going to use the selector and pick the other side of the piece that I'm going through. So now I've got a hole that goes from here to here. So there's a hole. Let's say I wanted to do a whole bunch of holes. If I was going to do it that way, it would take forever. So there is a better way. Um, so I'm going to make another sketch. Um, so I'm going to do it on this day. So let's say I have something that has this odd mounting hole pattern that is, um, say, like five holes in a uh, pentagon. So the, the geometry used for making holes is a point. Um, so I'm going to drop a point here, and that should be the center of my pentagon, and another point here. And I'm going to throw in some dimensions. Uh, let's say that we know that we want this to be three inches from the edge, and two inches from the top. Um, and then I'm going to straighten this guy there, and drop a dimension there. Now, if we've got a pattern that we want to make, there's a few pattern tools here that make it a lot faster and easier to create patterns. One is the rectangular pattern. One is the mirror pattern. Um, but we're going to be using a circular pattern. So if I pick for my geometry, the point that I want to repeat, and for my axis, the point that I want to rotate it around, um, you can make a circular pattern. And right now, we've got six of them. We want five, so we want ten of them. So now we've got these five center points for holes. And then if we go over to the model menu, which is anything that's turning a 2D shape into a 3D shape is going to be in this menu. And when we click on the hole tool, you can see that we got something different than before. Instead of um, having to define the uh, dimensions of our holes, we've already got selected all of our center points. Um, and so we don't want to set the center one because that was just a unique geometry. So I, I hit uh, the selector here, and then I shift click. When you shift click something, it selects or you select something. Um, so you select that. And then let's make these two holes. Make them number eight again. And let's make them, oh, why not? We'll do two all this time. So hit OK. And now we've got that pattern of holes go through all the things. Um, so now we've got this, this enclosure for something, whatever it may be. Um, let's say that whatever this product is is going to be sold to a bunch of people with small children. Those small children like to bash their heads against sharp corners. 
Um, we can't have that. So there's a couple of nice features for this. One is called fillet. Yes, it's pronounced fillet, not fillet. I don't know why. You'd have to ask the mechanical engineers or possibly the French. Um, and this rounds corners. So say I want to make these nice and round. I can select all of them. And you can choose the radius that you're rounding things by. Um, I just want the default, which is make an inch. And now we've got this nice round corner. This is especially important if you're working with someone who's going to be cutting these things on a milling machine or a CNC mill, because if you're cutting something on a CNC mill, the minimum radius that you can have for an inside corner is going to be the radius of the bit that's cutting it. Um, and again, this is something that if you're actually designing something to manufacture, you need to communicate with whoever's going to be manufacturing it and realize the limitations of what they can do. Um, so that's one of the main uses for filling is if you're designing something to be cut with a milling machine, um, you pretty much have to fill it all your inside corners. So that's a fillet. The other one up here is called a chamfer, and a chamfer instead of rounding corners just kind of cuts them all. So if I chamfer this, you can see that instead of being a sharp corner, now it's just kind of lighter. Um, those are the, the few features that I wanted to show off with this part. Um, before I move on, does anyone have any questions about anything I've shown so far, and does anyone want to see anything again? Okay, in that case, I'm going to move on to another way of making parts. This one is for round parts. So I'm going to make a new part. Uh, let's say you're doing something where you've got a shaft, uh, and that shaft needs to be different sizes over the length of the shaft. Um, so if you make a cross section of that shaft, um, so this, this line here is the center line of our shaft, and let's say the overall length is going to be three inches, um, and then we'll have, a, we'll have a half inch section that is Two five means it's going to be a half inch diameter because everything is divided by two since that's the center line. And we'll have a two inch section of um, And you can, in your dimensions, you can actually use um, fractions. So if I wanted to say make this one eighth, you'll figure out that that's point one two five. So you don't have to do all the math yourself. Uh, you could also just change units on the fly. So say I wanted to make this uh, three millimeters, but we'll also do that for you. Um, and it's got quite a few units that it can do. Um, so if I wanted to say make this um, actually I'm curious. Uh, Yes, it will. Um, there's one more I have to try. It won't do furlough. Okay. Um, but it has a lot of human that it can work in. Um, so now we've got the sketches fully defined. Everything's all purple. Um, so we can use the revolve tool. Um, and as you can see here, what it does is it rotates a sketch around the center axis and basically everything that's inside of that sketch it will keep. So if you if you've ever worked with the lathe it's pretty much the same principle as that. So the profile is highlighted in blue here or we pre-selected it because there was only one profile in the sketch. Here's the axis and you can see now we have a round part. Um, and you don't have to do the, the full rotation if you were making something that's like put around do that. I'm going to do the full rotation. Uh, so now we've got a shaft. Uh, let's say that this shaft is for a knob. And knobs a lot of times have little flatted shafts that they go on to hold together the D shape. So if we wanted to make a D shape on the end of this shaft, uh, we'd have to cut out of it. And we can do that ironically with the extrude tool. The extrude tool is also the cut tool in Inventor. This is one of the things that confuses SOLIDWORKS people. Um, so 
I just made a sketch on the end of this, and then if I just make a loop. So one of the things that Inventor does when you're trying to be helpful sometimes is it will snap. Uh, so you can see that it's trying to drag my cursor to that little point that comes up with the center. Um, and it's kind of a pain sometimes, and you have to watch it and make sure it doesn't accidentally constrain things where you don't want them. Uh, so now if I just make a dimension here, let's make this like Now I can use the extrude tool to cut. So here's extrude, here's cut. This is sort of like a, a union, so it'll keep the things that are in both. But we want to cut, and we will do two lists. So now we've got this D-shaped shaft, which would be good for putting on a knob or anything else that has that kind of shape that you need to put into it. Um, there's a few other features that I'm not going to get into today, but I'm going to just going to run through them real quick. Uh, the loft feature, um, this is something if you were doing like aerodynamic shapes or something, you'd probably be using a lot. You have a sketch at the beginning and a sketch at the end, and it figures out how to transition between them. Um, the sweep feature is like an extrude, except instead of going in a straight line, it can follow a curvy path. Um, ribs, if you were designing, uh, say, something out of, out of plastic that's going to be molded, these can be pretty valuable because it will automatically create ribs for you for to add strength to whatever you're making. Um, I talked about holes, I talked about fillets and chamfers. Shell, um, I can demonstrate this really quickly. Uh, so on this part before where I made this hollow box, I could have done something very similar. Um, I'm make a new part just to show this off. Um, just by making a box and then shelling it. So say, I've got this box. If I use the shell feature, I remove this face and set my thickness to 0.25. It'll make a hollow box just like that. So that's handy for some things. Um, for the most part, your workhorse is going to be extruded. Occasionally you'll use Revolve. It's very rare unless you're doing some really interesting geometry. I don't even know what this one does. Unless you're doing some really interesting geometry, then you'll start getting the lofts and sweeps. And, um, and of course, using the hole tool. Um, and don't just extrude circles for holes. It's bad. Don't do it. It's bad. You should feel bad. Um, the reason for that is when you do holes, it means that it will generate the documentation properly when you make drawings. Um, and also, it makes it a lot easier to change things and specify things than if you're extruding circles. So that's making parts. Um, does anyone have any questions about making parts before I move on to assemblies? Quiet room. OK. So um, let's make a new assembly. For this, I'm going to use some actual parts. Um, in my spare time, I've been designing a quad river UAV, which is still far from finished, but it's got some parts that I can play with. Um, it's taking its time making this assembly, but here we go. Okay, so we've got a blank assembly. Oh, one thing I meant to mention before, uh, my backgrounds are all blue here. Inventor these days uses a, a gray gradient that I don't like. Um, there's a lot of things you can tweak if you're into that kind of thing. Uh, if you go over the tools menu and application options, uh, you can change things like colors, um, sort of display things. You can change your default units somewhere in here. Um, so I use, I use the blue, which is what Inventor was when I started using it. And I think it's easier to see parts against the blue background than against the gray gradient. But, um, so when you open Inventor and it's a gray gradient, that's why. Anyway, so here's an assembly. Um, right now, there's nothing in it. So first thing you're going to do when you have an assembly is you're going to place a part. Um, so the part on the poster for this event was this little landing gear clip. Uh, oh, it's, it's telling you that uh, you're using an educational version, and you're gonna we're gonna put a watermark in that. Um, I don't care. So so here's uh, you automatically place one. I'm gonna place another one. So now I've got two of these, and you can see this one I can't move around. It's got a little push pin in it over here. 
And the first part you put in assembly is always, it's called grounded. Um, and if you want, you can disable that. You should always have one part in your assembly either grounded or constrained somehow to the origin, but we'll talk about that in a bit. Um, so you've got these parts, they're kind of floating around, and you want to put them together. The way you do that is with constraints. Um, so up here in the constraints menu, um, there's a few kinds of constraints. One of them is the mate constraint, which comes in two flavors. You've got mate and flush. And I'm just going to demonstrate that real quick. If you've got a mate constraint, it will make two surfaces touch each other. If you've got a flush constraint, it will make two surfaces, I can't quite see that. Uh, it will make, but it will make them face the same direction. Um, unfortunately, that wasn't very clear because they were kind of overlapping each other. But, uh, so in this case, we actually want to do flush. So we'll flush those together. And it, it helps as you're doing this to sort of rotate around so you can see the surfaces you're working with. Um, and actually, I'm going to turn my sound on for the next part. Um, so when you have a successful constraint, it makes the happiest noise in the universe. Um, I love that noise. Um, if your constraint fails, um, it'll make a noise more like this, or it doesn't make a noise. That. But um, so now I've constrained this in two dimensions. Um, so now it can only move in one dimension because I've flushed this top surface with this top surface and this side surface with this side surface. So now that's held in place and there's one more constraint that I need to make. Uh, this one is going to be a mate between these two surfaces. But I'm going to do something different here. I'm going to add an offset. So I'm going to make these three quarters of an inch apart. So now, it's fully constrained, can't move it at all. Um, I should probably show you what I'm building here. Uh, so what this is going to be is, this is the landing gear assembly for the quad rotor. And there's four of these that go on frame like this and hold it up. So, got these two in place, and you can see on the finished assembly, I've got these standoffs here that are actually what's holding it together, so let's add those. So place those, uh, there it is. Um, and I modeled all these parts. One thing to keep in mind when you're actually working with things is, nine times out of 10, if you're using off-the-shelf parts, the manufacturer does have CAD files. Usually they'll post them publicly on their website. Even if they don't, it's worth sending them an email because it is in their interest to convince you to use their stuff, and it's easier for you to use their stuff if they will send you CAD files. Um, so don't waste your time trying to model something really complicated and crazy that you're buying from somebody. Just ask them for a CAD file, because usually they'll have it. Um, so I'm going to drop these in place. I'm just kind of roughly placing them, and then I'm going to put the strings in. Um, so, so far we've used just this one type of constraint. Uh, and you can use it for round things too, so where I'm, sele I'm selecting the center axis, and then I can select the center axis of this, and now it's constrained in one dimension, and then I can select the face of this, and the face of this, and it's constrained in both. You can see, you can only rotate. Um, but there's a lot faster way to do that. If you're dealing with putting things into holes or lining up two holes, there's this thing called the insert constraint over here. And what the insert constraint will do is it selects both a axis and a face, so you actually get that little circle. And then you select it here, and um, that just did two constraints in one. Um, so I'll do the last one. Um, so that's two constraints. You can see there was there were a couple more in there. One of them is the tangent. Um, and I don't have anything to show this off with in this part, but if you wanted to, say, hold a, a wheel to a surface, or a ball to a surface, or uh, basically anything tangent to it, to anything else, you use the tangent constraint, and it works the same way as a main constraint. The other one is the angular constraint. This one can be kind of a pain to work with, um, but if, say, I wanted to constrain the angle of this, um, I can say that that's always going to be 15 degrees. And now, in that. Um, so 
that's the basics of constraints. Uh, one of the things as I was doing this um, that I just kind of glossed over is sometimes it's really hard for you to reach the, the shapes that you want to constrain to. If you hover over something, uh, let's see if I can do this. If you hover over something for a little while, it'll give you this helpful drop down menu which shows you all the geometry at that point. So that is a basic assembly, and of course you can combine smaller assemblies into larger assemblies. Um, so let's make another assembly. Um, so I'm going to drop in one of my frame pieces here, um, and this piece here is actually it's made up of let's see one, two, three extrusions. When you're in an assembly, you can go in and edit individual parts just by double clicking on them, and then we'll open up the part inside of the assembly, and then you can return out to the assembly. And if you make changes in one of your parts, it will automatically update the whole assembly. So let's say I go in here and I want to move this whole. So I just change the dimension there from two and a half to two and three quarters. You can see the whole move. To go out, back out to the assembly, everything moves, because everything is constrained relative to that geometry, which can sometimes get you in trouble if you constrain a bunch of stuff relative to geometry and then go and delete it. Um, but it's also really convenient because it means that you can change something in one file and see how it affects everything else. Um, so like I said, you can do assemblies inside of other assemblies as sub-assemblies. So I'm going to drop in my landing gear assembly and drop in two of them. Um, and then I can constrain it in place using the same as before and insert constraints. Um, so I can drop the values on that hole and the values on that hole. So that is the basics of assembly. So now let's say you've got this, this really pretty assembly of something you want to build. Um, and you go down to, to pick a box, or you know a guy who knows a guy who can get into a machine shop, and you say, hey, I want you to make this. And he says, well, what is it? And you say, oh, I've got this great model. And he says, well, I want a drawing, because I can't take a model into a machine shop. Um, so you make him a drawing. And the way you do that, is you make a new drawing here. Uh, and a lot of the, the correct ways to do this are things that I've never really been trained. Uh, and there's also some preferences for certain people. Um, some people really like different kinds of annotation. And there's many, many ways to skin a cat in terms of engineering drawings. There are probably about 12 ways just to annotate where holes are on a piece. Uh, and some are preferred by some people and some are preferred by others. Uh, in general, if you have a good relationship with your machinist, you'll get to know what they prefer and what they really hate. Um, and this is going to take forever to load again. In the meantime, does anyone have any questions about assemblies or about parts or about anything, a favorite color? What's your favorite color, Ed? I don't have one, actually. Oh. What's your favorite color? I don't know. Favorite color? Yeah. Favorite color? While I'm waiting for this to load, um, is there anything that anyone particularly wants to see today? See me demonstrate, see with this software. You're already <coughs> bored. Drawing up an AutoCAD now. The I have not thing. touched AutoCAD in about. You can do it. <laughs> five years? Six years? Okay, so here's a drawing. Um, it's just a blank sheet of paper. The first thing you're going to do whenever you create a drawing is I just right clicked on this sheet over here and I'm going to edit it because we don't have any size C paper around here, most likely. It is 17 by 22. You 
you probably want size A, which is better known as letter. Unfortunately, now our title block is huge. So let's delete that. And up here in drawing resources, drawing resources, uh, you can grab a more reasonable title block. This is the A size one. And if you just double click that, it will pop into your drawing. So now you've got a blank sheet of paper. Let's add some stuff to it. So the first thing you're going to do is create a base view. Uh, base view will load in something from a model. Um, these are part one from before. And you're going to have to pick things like what orientation you want it to appear in and what size you want. So let's go with uh, about eight scale probably. And we'll do the front view. Uh, we can do a little bit with that. So now you've got this drawing, which is a nice scale drawing, um, but you don't have any dimensions in it. And all the information about this part exists in the part. So, fortunately, it's really easy to add dimensions. So, we pick our dimension tool up here. Um, so you can manually drop in a zillion and twelve dimensions. This is just allowing you to edit it. Uh, so if you wanted to add some stuff on the end, you could. But usually, you just don't need it the same. Um, so that's a basic way to add dimensions. If you want to add a whole bunch of dimensions from one line at the same time, you click the baseline tool and then select. So what I'm doing there is when I click it, uh, and then I right click, it'll move on to the next steps, and then just undo those two. Um, so when I was doing um, baseline dimensions before, I clicked one, and then the first thing, and then I hit continue, uh, and then I put that in place, and then I'm left clicking, left clicking, left clicking. Um, so there's a lot of things to dimension on this, and I'm not going to go through but in general, if there's something that could ever be a question, you need to dimension it, because otherwise the information doesn't exist. Um, so things like diameter of this hole, diameter of this hole. Um, and like I was saying, you should use the hole tool, because when you use the hole tool, you get these nice little dimensions here, and you can do things like just say, that's a typical dimension for that hole. Um, so there's a lot of dimensions you would have to do on this part. I can't be bothered to do them right now. If you were actually doing the part, there's a lot of things you'd have to define so that the machine could actually look at it and know where things are going. If you're not going to be giving this to a machinist, say you want to laser something down in the paint box, 
There's a slightly different process. I'm going to go through that. Um, the side hole that has the thread. What? Do the side hole that has the thread, right? Oh, right. Does it actually pop up? Isn't there a way to pop up? Um, oh. I don't want this one. Hold the thread. So, because that's a hole, it knows. And so this is saying it's an 832 threaded hole that is tapped down three quarters of each. Um, so if you wanted to laser cut something, and who doesn't want to laser cut something, there's a slightly different process. Um, so I'm going to make a new drawing. And the first thing I'm going to do is I'm going to change my sheet size. I uh, changed the size of the laser cutter downstairs is, I believe, 18 by 24 inches is the maximum size. Um, and I want to delete my border because I don't want to cut that into my part. And delete my title block because I don't want to cut that into my part. And I'm going to start dropping in some parts. Um, and it's very important when you're laser cutting that you do everything at one-to-one -one scale or otherwise you will get out exactly what you put in, which is not the right size. Um, so, let's say I wanted to cut one of these, so I just right click and done. So now I've got one here, uh, I probably want to do more than one. Personally, when I'm doing something like this, uh, I prefer instead of dropping a whole bunch into the drawing, I actually make an assembly just for cutting things out. Uh, I think I have one of those here, uh, maybe, maybe, I thought I did, maybe I don't. Um, but if you, say, make an assembly, Now it's going to load the content center. It's going to take a while. Um, but, if, but you can make an assembly with a whole bunch of different parts in it, and you just lay them out in the shape that you want to cut them out of your material. It makes it a lot easier to lay out your cuts, and then you can just drop it in the drawing. Um, so, for example, if, say, I wanted to cut out four of these, I would just drop four down. to if you've got four of those out of one sheet, we'll just make a sheet. And then if I just drop in that assembly I just made, there I've got all four of them. Um, now if you wanted to laser cut this, um, the laser cutter computer down in Thinkbox doesn't have Inventor on it, so you need to export it into something different. Um, so if you go into, I believe it's, yes, it's in Save As, and Save Copy As, you've got a lot of file type options. You want a DXF. DXF is a very sort of universal CAD file that is accepted by many, many things, including assorted vector graphics programs like Corel Draw, which is um, Ian's program of choice for running the laser cutter. Um, so if you save it as a DXF file and then bring it down to Thinkbox, they will know exactly what to do with it and they can help you cut out things with lasers. Uh, if you're curious, laser roll materials, uh, acrylic plastic up to about a quarter of an inch thick, ABS up to about an eighth of an inch thick, uh, assorted other things. Um, I think they tried balsa and were not very happy with the results. No, that's not true. Balsa is like awesome. Yeah, but it's flattered the lens. Well, everything has lens. Yeah. Um, That's how they've always been though, so. <laughs> um, so you can do, if, you want, if you're doing something, if you're just prototyping, you can actually laser, laser cut things out of like map board and cardboard type stuff. Um, 
Laser cutters are really cool. Unfortunately, the materials you can do with them are pretty limited. Um, so, ideally, you would find somebody who actually has access to a machine shop that's difficult on this campus, but not impossible. Hi, Tom. Can I Uh, yes, no. The rules on actually getting access to the video shop are not as clear cut as the video shop. You're going to draw you have what you want to do, and then you do it, as long as you're going to work with other people. Yeah. So it's kind of what you're talking about. And you've taken 172, and yes. you haven't pissed off Jim Drake on Um Those are <laughs> those are good criteria. <laughs> uh, with Once Thinkbox actually gets up and running, we should hopefully have more machine and resources on this campus but there are sort of bureaucratic things that need to happen before that can happen. Um, what kind of laser? An awesome one. What, what are you asking? Like, what kind of chemistry is it? Yes. What kind of... Like um, CO2 laser? I don't actually... It's Chris, do you know what kind of laser I think it's a CO2. It's a CO2? 60 watt. Um, so that's mostly what I've got. Um, this is the kind of thing that you can really only learn by playing with it. Um, and whereas there's a lot of other things I can probably show, I don't know if they'd ever be applicable to your lives, and I don't know what the ideal way to show them is. So I definitely encourage you to download the software. Uh, fair warning, it takes a very long time to download because it's a couple of gigabytes. Um, doing it on Case Internet is actually not that painful. Doing it elsewhere might be. Um, but I do encourage you to play around with it. Um, and of course, if you really do prefer SolidWorks, you can use the SolidWorks down in the ThinkBox, uh, or if you have access to one of the handful of computer labs on campus that have SolidWorks. I still prefer Inventor because I've been using it for six, seven years now, um, and because I don't have a copy of SolidWorks on my laptop. So that's my main reason for doing this in Inventor, and I really don't think there's much of a difference between so, questions, thoughts, comments? Yes? When you mentioned CNC machines, are you just talking about stuff like the laser cutter and the router, or does it also output stuff for the CNC machine? Like so it can't do, um, like, actual toolpath generation for a CNC okay. machine. Uh, you would have to, if you output it a, a DXF, um, you can import that into something like Mastercam and do toolpaths. Um, and there are sort of people on campus who have access to things like that and knowledge about things like that. Tom's raising his hand again. <laughs> so, um, and I don't think SolidWorks can do CAM internally either. No, um, most of it is on SolidWorks. Yeah. So, anyone else? Okay. Thanks for coming, everyone.